Good evening, church. So glad to gather together with you online, and I pray that this time will be uplifting in the Lord. If you've got your copy of God's Word, turn with me to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, we've been following uh, through the book of Acts, going with Paul through everything, and we are now at the time where he is giving another defense. Um, between uh, Jerusalem and Caesarea, he gives five, and we are right in the middle of that. He is about to give his defense before King Agrippa in, in chapter 26. And if you were with us last week, Acts chapter 25, it kind of set up the next couple chapters. Um, not necessarily anything huge or mon monumental happening in chapter 25, but without it, uh, we, would have, we, would, we would not be able to piece the whole book together. So um, let's look at Acts chapter 26 tonight. And as you're turning there, I uh, ask you to, to pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for your word and the truths of it and the foundation of it, and we can stand on it and we can root our, ourselves in it. Lord, pray for our time tonight in your word that, God, we would grow from it. Lord, I pray if there's somebody listening and watching that needs you, that's never surrendered to you, God, that uh, they would hear your word and it would draw them to you tonight. Uh, Lord, just ask you to, to continue to, to guide us and direct us, give us... Um, Continue to give us hope uh, for tomorrow, God, because it is found in you. And Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen. So if, you, if you've got the chapter 26, um, you can be turning. And we're going to look at two verses tonight. Um, I encourage you to go back and read the, the whole chapter. But we're going to look at two verses, the kind of the core, the center for where Paul is in this defense that he's giving. Because it could be so simple and so easy to get caught up in all these different defenses he's been giving. And you're like, okay, I've heard this, I've heard this, we're just going to skip to the end and, and see what happens. But um, what we need to understand is, is this, is it's important for us to read word for word, line by line through uh, this text. And um, it's important for us to understand that words matter. Every word in here matters uh, for us. As I've shared before, all Scripture is inspired equally, um, but sometimes the application may not fit where we are today. It may be for tomorrow. It may be for next week. And so what I want us to think about when we think about words and, and, and in this case, writing this, uh, we live in an age where, sadly, it doesn't seem uh, that words seem to mean much. Uh, not that uh, the culprit is the digital age, but I believe... Um, it has greatly affected the written word. Uh, but Paul's day, in his day, writing letters came at such a significant cost. Each and every word had a cost associated with it. And Luke, right here, he's recording this message, um, and that means that he understood Paul's work. He viewed Paul's work in such significance that he understood how important it was to the health of the local church. And so tonight, if you've got your copy of God's Word, we're going to read in Acts 26, verse 22 and 23. And this is Paul in the middle of his defense to King Agrippa. Uh, and Festus is, is there as well as, as, as well as an audience, almost like a courtroom. So in verse uh, 22, we see, To this day I have had the help that comes from God. So I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Now that's a good word, that's a good message, and that's something that's good for us to take home um, in, in the matter of here Paul meets Agrippa, and he does it, and he begins in a manner that is different than other times. He's, he's ultimately going to get and, and say those verses we just read um, for them to understand, ultimately, that, that Christ has always been. Um, he, he's trying to bridge the gap between Jews and Christians and, and say, hey, listen, this is where we're going. We want to point to Christ. But he, he's trying to help his Jewish brothers and sisters along to get there. But Paul meets with Agrippa. Uh, in, in, in chapter 26, verse 1, and he begins the same manner that he has acted in the last several chapters. He begins, in this case, by extending his hand to Agrippa. 
And he doesn't do this for showmanship. He doesn't do this to add uh, drama or flair to his speech. But he does it to, to show um, the gravity of what he's about to say. And he expresses gratitude for this opportunity um, and to make a defense before the king. Now, he's not like when he was put on, put on trial and a lawyer came in and just tried to just uh, give so many compliments to the judge overseeing it that it was just, it was just bad. <laughs> and that it, you could just tell he was just kind of cheesing up to the judge. Paul wasn't doing that. He was showing gratitude for Agrippa willing to see what um, or see him to hear what he had to say and early on starting in verse 3 we find that Paul he directs all of his attention to Agrippa he wants Agrippa to know that Paul's only focus right now is him his earthly focus is centered on this one man Paul knows that he that God has given him the opportunity uh, to share the gospel with a man of great authority and power and God may put us in that same position one day. Now, this comes after the last chapter where we left Festus and Agrippa, and uh, they were in a conversation that centered around the empty tomb. They, they were confused. They didn't know what to make of it. They didn't know what to make of Paul. But Paul, even in this moment of great stress and anxiety, Paul stands ready to present the truth of the gospel. So it doesn't seem anything would shake Paul. No matter what was happening, he was all ready to give a defense. So we find Paul giving his defense by giving his personal testimony again. Now, believers, we should not underestimate the power that comes from the story of how God has, has changed our lives, the story he has given us. Telling how Jesus has changed our lives is a powerful way to communicate the truth of Christ. It, it also shows how His grace has worked within us. We should never tire of hearing testimony from someone, and we should never um, shy away from giving our testimony to other people. But Paul speaks here um, in giving his testimony. He speaks to his Jewish upbringing, um, and in verse 6 he says, And now I stand here on trial because of my hope and promise made by God to our fathers. So Paul, he is a, appealing to the Jews in a way where he's kind of condemning them. Um, he's condemning them for accusing him of abandoning his Jewish faith. He's accusing them or condemning them of, of, of the crimes that they're charging him with. He said, I haven't abandoned my faith. I haven't forgot who God is. I haven't gone against him. And so he's, as he's still living in a missional mindset, he's, he's also living in a way where he's, he's uh, living a bold witness for Christ. And so this is the best way he has found that he can present the gospel and be true to what God has called him to do. And at the same time, um, address the issues at hand. But he highlights these changes brought against him, um, and he shines light on how, the, how absurd these changes sound. Um, the Jews, they think that he is crazy. He's a madman for believing that God raised Jesus from the grave. Now, again, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So just, just this sounds like an elaborate story. Not only did they not believe Jesus was the Messiah, so... For Paul to believe that God raised this man from the dead, it's just, it's insane um, in their eyes. But Paul, he's pointing out that um, the resurrection is consistent with Jewish beliefs. That, that's, that's why he's, he's said what he said in verse 6. He even shifts the conversation uh, to point back to his life before Christ, where he would have identified himself with those Jews who are now accusing him of this crime. So he's, he's trying to relay the message of the gospel, but at the same time, be personal, be on the same level um, with these Jews that are there. Because again, if you haven't been with us, King Agrippa himself is a Jew. So he would have had 
he would have had similar upbringing to, to Paul as far as learning the Old Testament and what it says and uh, knowing uh, these fundamental truths of, of, of the Jewish culture and their faith. But what we need to remember is only the power of Christ can a life be changed. And Paul's life was changed. Our lives are changed by the same power of Christ. Let us not get caught up in, our t- in, 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 this, in aspects of our testimony that we, through our eyes and ears, may not think are glamorous, are flashy. But we have to remember this. The saving power of Christ is all that is the focus of our testimony. If our testimony ever focuses on on what we've done or who we are, then it's missed the point. The point of our testimony is to testify about how Christ has changed us. And so he tells the story of his conversion on the Damascus Road, and he is trying to convey when uh, he came in contact with Jesus that the only thing he could do was surrender. He had no other choice but, yes, Lord, Hearing Jesus say these words, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it, it is, it's hard uh, for you to, to kick against the goads. He says here in, in, in chapter 26. Now this is something that the Romans would have understood. They would have understood this saying. Um, this would have been an illustration that uh, they would have been familiar with. You know, A goad would have been something uh, that they would use to prod uh, oxen like a sharp stick. Uh, we might think, if you ever move cattle, like a hot stick, uh, to get uh, them in place, to move them around, but to poke them so they, they would move. And if you were an ox and you kicked against it, it would ultimately just hurt you and not help you. It wouldn't be beneficial to you. Uh, you would w- walk away limping uh, from that. And what Jesus was meaning by this was, what in the world, uh, what in, what in the world do I have to do to get your attention, Paul. You know, this was evidence that long before the Damascus Road that God had been at work in Paul's life. And so this was, it just came to this point where Paul had to ask himself, you know, why am I doing this? And, you know, we may have, you may have a similar testimony to that where you, you, you fought God and you ran against, uh, away from God for so long. And once you, you met him, you're like, why did I do this? Why did I kick against the goad? Um, and, and, and Paul's wordage here, that's, that's what have been what we'd, we'd say. But the testimony, this testimony from Paul, proves that God's hand of provision had been on Paul his entire life. His hand, one writer said, his hand rested on Paul even when Paul lived as his enemy. And the same could be said of us. Now, we, we may not have persecuted Christians the same way Paul did, but we've all rebelled against God. We've sinned against God, and we've rejected God. Whether it sounds good to say or not, and it's not good to say, but whether we like the way it sounds, probably a better way to say it. Whether we like the way it sounds or not, we've all been against God in our life. Every one of us. Even if you were born, and that first Sunday after you were born, your parents brought you to church, you've, you've still been against God. And when we continue to actively, uh, or, uh, or active, um, <laughs> we, can, can, we can tend to sin, and we know we're doing it, that, that's what we're doing. But Al Mohler says this, and I like this quote. He says, if God's will beats the drum of your life, and has led you to that moment of saving faith, then every moment of your life bears an eternal significance. Think about that. And, and, and just outside looking in, we, we've read through Paul's life. We see where he's been. We see where the Lord has taken him. We see how he's grown him. Uh, Paul gives testimony to how he was educated, how he was brought up. Every bit of that. Every bit of that has eternal significance. Now, Paul, early on as a kid, as a teenager, as a young adult, he didn't understand what God's will for his his life was. But God knew. The same can be said for you and I. And you may be listening and watching tonight and like, well, I I don't know 
anything about this God. Either God can't have a plan for me. Uh, nothing in my life goes well. I promise you, if you don't know the Lord and you seek after him, he will answer you. And he will show you um, what his will is for your life. But every bit of our life is meaningful. Every bit of our life is meaningful. And if you're a believer, you should pray. Pray for your non-believing family members and friends. If they are the ones that kick against the goads, then it would be too sharp for them to continue to do it. Pray that God would work through that. And he may use you to do it. I've shared with our students before um, that growing up, there was a couple of us guys uh, in our youth group, and we, we hung out together. Uh, I've shared with them before, my, my closest friends growing up were from my youth group. Um, <clears throat> and it was four or five girls and three or four of us guys, and we'd all do stuff together. Go to the movies, go get something to eat, hang out together after church, things like that. We, it, we were just a close-knit group. But if you break it, guys and girls, the guys, we always hung out and did something different times. And one time we had, uh, I'd moved to help move a friend of mine in, in a community college, and uh, we had moved him in. We are like, hey, man, we're going to go down the road to mall and, and get something to eat and just hang out. So we, we went and did that. And uh, while we were there, we got to talking, and, and our conversation just became heated. And I could just feel the conviction of the Lord. And he said, you need to say something to him. Um, because that's, that's it, how, this, how my friend was acting was, was going against God, and things he was saying was not pleasing to the Lord. And he, he claimed to be a Christian. And, and so I just I confronted him, and I said, man, that's, that's, that's not what the Bible says. That's, that's not honoring to the Lord, and, and, and you know that. And it just got quiet. And, and that was the quietest ride home uh, we ever had. And, until this day... That friend and I, we, we don't talk a lot. Um, but um, probably about six months, a year after that interaction, um, I was pulled up at Sonic getting something to eat. And in my hometown, that's where everybody kind of hung out. Uh, and I tell somebody's walking up, and I think it's the car hop with my food, and it's that friend. And he said, hey, man, how's it going? I said, I'm doing good. And we talked for a little bit, and he said, I just want you to know something. You know, I appreciate you kind of calling, uh, calling my sin out, basically. Calling that to, to my, in front of me. Uh, I didn't want to hear it, but I needed to hear it. And so God puts us, believer, he puts us in people's lives, not to call them out and be legalists and say, oh, you're a sinner, but to, um, to, to, to work like that sometimes, to do his will in, in, in other people's lives, to be there for accountability. And as, as uncomfortable as it may be, if, it, if it's for kingdom growth and what God desires from us, it can't be wrong. It can't be a bad deal, um, even though earthly it may feel weird. But Paul, he goes on to give more details of this encounter with Christ, uh, more than we find in Acts 9. You may be thinking, I didn't, you know, I didn't read nothing about goads in, in Acts 9. Well... He shows in verse 16 that Jesus uh, stands there and tells him um, that his purpose is going to be to be a servant and a witness. You know, Jesus here, he has transformed Paul from being a murderer to being a missionary. And he tells Paul, you're going to be a servant and a witness. And it's almost as, as soon as, as Paul was able to see from that account, he was like, I'm a servant. I'm here. I'm here to serve. What do you need? <laughs> he was ready to go. And he had encountered Jesus. And we can encounter Jesus as well. Now, you may say, I've never had a Damascus Road experience. I have never saw a blinding light that knocked me down and heard Jesus' audible voice. But the same power that conquered sin and death on the grave that saved Paul can save you. And if you're a believer, it has saved you, and it's called you into a kingdom purpose. But Jesus, right here, he sends Paul to the Jews and the Gentiles with some key things. And let's take a look at them real quick. One, he says to open their eyes, turn from darkness to light. Without Christ, everyone is spiritually blind. 
the power of the gospel makes the lost found and the blind see. The second thing is this, to turn from the power of Satan to God. Ephesians 2, 1 through 2 tells us that you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That term right there, the spirit of the power of the air, is another name for Satan. Only one can overpower Satan, and that is Jesus. And we are to turn from Satan to God. The third thing is this, receive forgiveness of sins and place among those, excuse me, and a place among those who are sanctified. And sanctified by our faith. Not only will the blind see, not only will Satan's grip crumble because of Christ, but by faith, people will receive forgiveness of sins and have an eternal place in the household of God. That's so good. That's so good. That's why our hearts should desire uh, to be evangelists. That's why our hearts desire to continue to to bring up our kids and grandparents, grandkids in in faith in Christ, to continue to pour into them, to pray over them. And and not only family members, but our friends and our neighbors to to live with boldness so they can have an understanding of who Christ is. But in verse 19, we see that that here it's the heart of Paul's argument. It's kind of a shifting again. And and, and as if you've, you've been with us long, you see it Acts. And Paul kind of shifts throughout this. But he's, he's, we see a shift here in Acts 19 where Luke is focusing on the heart of Paul's argument. He is conveying to Agrippa that he is doing what he is doing as an act of obedience to God. Not a career path he has chosen, not something his mama told him to do, but God has put this on his heart. So we either respond to God in obedience... Or we respond to God in rejection. I heard a preacher say one time, even partial obedience is still disobedience. But Paul, he urges his listeners to do two things. And not just Festus and Agrippa, but everybody there in the courtroom that day. He's urging them to do two things. The first one we see is this. Repent and turn to God. Without repentance, there is no good news. Without turning away from sin, there is no gospel. And Paul was trying to make that clear. Repent and turn to God. Two, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Now here, Paul, he's balancing grace and works. Ephesians 2.8 tells us that for by grace you've been saved through faith. And that verse is also balanced with John 6, 44. It says that no one can come to Jesus without the Father drawing him. So we see that we don't do works to get us to heaven. We do works because we have been saved. We have experienced the saving power of Christ. It drives us to want to serve uh, our neighbors, our community. Wants us to serve our church, not just inside the walls. I am thankful for every person in my life that has ever served in the walls of the church. Whether it's been Sunday school teachers, nursery workers, guys that run the soundboard, people that sing in the choir, and the list can go on and on. People that just want to set up tables and chairs. I am grateful for every one of those people from the time I was a little kid running around church until now. Because... We have to do it together. And when you're, in my opinion, when you're serving with people you love, it just makes it even better. But two, being the church and serving outside the walls. And for, for us, for believers, we, we, we got to find a balance. We can't, we can't do one so far out and one so far in that that's all we do. Um, sometimes we, we like to get comfortable and say, well, hey, I do this and this and this at the church I don't need to go out there and do that. No, we need to. We need to go out there and do that. Well, we also need to, to serve the church in the church as well. So, and that's for 
every one of us to, to understand a balance and to do. But what Paul is emphasizing here is the grace of God saves us and the works of repentance flow from our hearts. Works don't make us achieve salvation, but what we do after we become saved reflects what we believe. The grace of God saves us. The works of repentance will flow out of our hearts. Paul, he began um, here to, again, shift again. Um, he began to somewhat preach to the Jews using an Old Testament text. Paul says that the Christ must come and suffer and that he would rise from the dead and proclaim uh, the light to both Jews and Gentiles in verse 23, our, our two passages we read. That's, I mean, he's, he's just starting to turn on his preacher mode right there. And that's what he said. And when he does that, he, he's pointing them back to a text they would have known, that the Jews would have heard. He's pointing them back to Isaiah 53, where the prophet Isaiah talks about... Um, talks about the coming Christ and how he would suffer. And he would ultimately die. He's wanting to say, listen, you're saying I'm not falling in line with Jewish custom. You're saying I'm starting a new religion or I'm a part of this, this new deal. Who is this Jesus? And Paul is saying, I'm trying to tell you he's one and the same that you have learned about and heard about for years. Again, he's not bowing down from proclaiming the gospel, but he's trying to meet them where they are within what they know. Jesus fulfilled this prophecy in full. There is nothing else that could be done to fulfill it. The nails pierced Jesus' flesh. Those nails fulfilled Isaiah 53. There's nothing that could ever fulfill it more. There's nothing that could take away from what Jesus did. He has fully fulfilled that prophecy. And so the moment here that Paul mentions Jesus' resurrection, Festus kind of gets squirrely. He's like, well, uh, uh, he interrupts him. He says, and changes him. Uh, he, he just said, man, you are just, you're crazy. Your, 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 your mental capacity is gone. Your brain is fried from all this traveling you've been doing and talking. You have convinced yourself of this. And this may be the only answer, realistically, that Festus could come up with uh, while he and Agrippa in chapter 25 were having this conversation. They were talking about Jesus. And like, Jesus, this, this man supposedly rose from the dead, is what, what Paul said. But Paul, when he was brought before them, he, he never backed down. But Paul, he rejects this idea in front of Festus. And he appeals to Agrippa in verse 26. He says, Can Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. So he knew where Agrippa came from. He knew how to approach it. Festus, he was a Gentile and had, had, had never heard the good news. So Paul, at the same, he, he, has, he has two influential men and he's having to basically preach two different things to them that come back and point to Jesus. Agrippa had never heard of him. Or, excuse me, Agrippa grew up hearing of the Messiah and how he would come, and Festus had never heard. And so he's trying to do this in a manner that he's pointing to Jesus through all of it. But this trial goes on from Paul being the one put on the stand to Agrippa being the one centered out and questioned right here in the middle of it. But Agrippa, he doesn't reject the premise of what Paul is saying, but he points out that he had not had that much exposure to the gospel. And that sounds like a political answer, and it may have been. That's why, again, why Paul was trying to appeal to Agrippa's Old Testament knowledge and, and what he would have known. But at the end of this passage, we find Paul appealing to the audience, to those in the crowd there at, at this hearing, that... Um, that he uh, wants to, for them to understand, one, his obligation to the gospel, but two, he wants them to know the truth. He wants them to be saved. Uh, and we need to take note of that. And we need to keep in mind that if we want people to enjoy all that we enjoy in the gospel, we, we need to be that bold. 
We need to be that up front. We don't need to forget where we came from. But how can we keep the gospel to ourselves, realistically? If we want people to enjoy the joy and the hope and the security that we have in the gospel, why would we keep it to ourselves? So let's close out with a couple questions tonight. First one. If you had two minutes to explain to someone um, who, uh, who you know, a friend, a relative, uh, if you had two minutes to explain to them that how your life has been transformed by grace, what would you say? How would you explain how your life has been transformed by the grace of God? If you don't know, I encourage you to, to try that out, to test that out. Just go, go to the mirror and just say, hey, this is how the grace of God has changed my life. And I promise you, if you do that and you think an hour how honest, how God has worked in your life, you're going to talk longer in two minutes. But can you? Can you give a two-minute defense of the gospel, a testimony of how he has changed your life, the second thing is this, and this is, and, and this is a quote, and we kind of want to go from this, but evangelism takes time. Christians cast out gospel seeds. That's kind of a line of thought more than a quote. So how does this view of witnessing keep us patient and persistent? Because I shared last week that um, most people who are converted um, it starts with conversation it starts with building relationship there are some that when they hear the gospel they're like I need that and they surrender and they're saved right then they repent of their sins and they never turn back God has the power to do that but when God desires to use us for kingdom growth and for his glory he desires for us to take the gospel out and we may not see a convert from the message and the testimony we give, but we plant that seed. So how do we stay patient and persistent in that? So I pray that we would keep the gospel in the forefront of our minds. And, and when we do that, that we wouldn't grow weary and tired and say, well, I haven't seen any growth, any fruit um, hadn't seen anything come back in for me sharing my testimony and me talking about Jesus. So I just, I just don't know if I want to do it. I pray that we would not grow weary. I pray we would not grow tired of that. But it would also give us an opportunity to reflect inwardly and say, this is my testimony. This is what Christ has done for me. Have a good evening.